So it's been uh, it's been long two days, but we've left we've left the most interesting panel to the end. So um, evidence and institutional redesign. How does or how should empirical evidence be mapped? To policy, we have um, Eva Vivalt from the University of Toronto. Uh, Max Casey um, says Harvard here, but is it Oxford? Um, and Arun Dube from UMass Amherst. So um, let them take you. Eva, you want to start? Thanks. Uh, very excited to be here. And um, I'm going to be talking about evidence-based policy making um, and in particular you know policymakers um, make very important decisions uh, we hope that they are evidence-based or at least you know informed by evidence and yet I would argue that to have evidence-based decision making we really need three things to happen we need there to be evidence uh, for people to interpret the evidence correctly and to have the willingness and capacity to act on that evidence um, so most of us here work on that first point on building up the evidence base, my own work included. Um, there's also uh, some political economy issues that fall under that third point there. I'm going to be focused mostly on the first and second points. Um, you know, we have heard earlier today that there may be some evidence that's missing, there may be biases um, that uh, go into that. Um, and so I'm going to be really focused on uh, the production of evidence and some of that translation uh, to policy. This will draw on a number of different areas um, and will kind of be a whirlwind tour because, you know, this is the last panel of the last day and everybody's kind of tired. So we're going to have lots of pretty pictures. <laughs> So, oh, there is a lag here. Okay, here we go. So first, let's start off. First stop on the whirlwind tour. We all know about publication bias and specification searching. One of the things that can bias some of our results. Um, so you may have seen these kinds of graphs of Z statistics where there's a spike in marginally significant results, suggesting some publication bias. Um, and likewise, uh, sometimes uh, you might see these kinds of figures about uh, how much work is underpowered. Um, so this particular paper found uh, that many studies only had you know, 0.1 power, which is really, really low for most of the outcomes. Um, now, what that means is that in practice, if you do see some kinds of positive impacts, well, that's more likely to be a false positive. Um, and this can arise because, you know, maybe you only power your studies for a couple of outcomes and then um, at the end of the day, you, you throw in a whole bunch more outcomes. Why not? The marginal value, you know, marginal cost of throwing in an additional outcome is going to be really low. So let's try it. Um, but of course, it has implications for the results that we um, end up with. So of course, there's a bunch of solutions that other people have suggested involving pre-analysis plans, pre-registration, and also a sort of social norms based approach um, where you know, we want to encourage, especially uh, young people, grad students to um, you know, realize, well, hey, you know, we all are trying to do some you know, real scientific work here. We should accord to some norms. Um, but another strategy as well that I wanna highlight is that you can try to make the null results more interesting. So um, with Stefano Della Vigna, um, I set up this uh, social science prediction platform. You see the URL here, it's kind of mimicking social science registry. Um, and that is to gather ex ante forecasts from researchers as to what studies will find. So if you're a researcher, you can go to the platform, you can um, describe your study, upload a forecasting survey and get forecasts from other people in the discipline. And the idea here, at least in part, is that, okay, well, when you have completed your study, you can go back, you can then compare what you found with what people thought you would find and say, look, this is how we added to the literature, you know, and especially if you've got a precisely estimated result of zero, right? Those are the ones that you're often going to have publication bias against. Well, here you can say, um, look, this may be a zero, but actually you thought that this program would have an effect. So this zero is interesting. You know, I have shifted your beliefs, hopefully, if you're updating on the evidence. Um, so 
Over time, the hope is that we'll also help to mitigate the publication bias against null results, at least. Um, there may always be publication bias towards, you know, novel results, but that's maybe a little bit, you know, at least I would think a little bit better than uh, <laughs> publication bias against zero. Um, there's other benefits as well. You know, I refer people onto this uh, paper if you're interested in um, that. Um, there are many other things it ties into um, here as well. Um, but moving on to the second point in this uh, whirlwind tour, uh, generalizability. So there's this wonderful paper uh, in the biomedical area um, looking at, you know, everything both causes and cures cancer. So those red dots are each one study, and you see that the results are kind of all over the place. Um, so you know, what can we make from this kind of literature? Well, I went and I did something very similar for the economics uh, literature. So this was based off of 20 meta-analyses in development economics um, from conditional cash transfers, um, deworming, um, studies like that. And here you see the standardized mean difference. So these are effect sizes in standard deviations. Um, so there's a few things you can note here. Um, first of all, they are also all over the place. So I'll, I'll give you some summary stats in the next slide. Um, but also effects tend to be pretty small. So a typical program or, uh, outcome studied will, will have maybe 0.1 um, standard deviation impact. So if you know you've got some other study you're doing in development economics that has 0.2 and you want to argue that's actually impressively large, you, you can refer to this. <laughs> Um, so, oops, I'll advance here. Okay, so um, in terms of quantifying this a bit, if you were just to try to look at the mean result within an intervention outcome combination, so say the effect of conditional cash transfers on enrollment rates, um, your best guess as to what another study will find will only have the correct sign about 60% of the time. Um, and the median ratio of the, that should say root mean squared error, sorry, there's a typo there, root mean squared error to that mean is 2.5. So um, given that that's the root mean squared error, that's actually pretty comparable in some sense to the mean, but then that's a very large number for that, right? <laughs> um, so this was a little bit surprising. Um, that's also all to say that as we were a little bit hearing in some of the talks earlier, you can always find a study that's going to support um, a particular viewpoint, uh, which is a little bit um, emphasizes that we should really be trying to encourage people updating on the totality of the evidence. Um, and another subtle point here I want to emphasize is there can be a real trade-off between internal and external validity um, in a practical way. If you're uh, trying to build up your, um, decide on your sampling frame, well, you could include more diverse groups, but that is also potentially going to increase the variance in your outcome variable and possibly increase the research costs. I'll give you some examples. Um, suppose you are doing a study in the US and you're thinking, okay, well, I want to include people in the sample who are uh, unstably housed. Well, um, you're going to have to try to find those people uh, for your follow up survey. So you, you may have more attrition um, and the outcomes may vary more. Um, these things are going to hurt your power, which is, you know, going into your internal validity, right? So, um, and as, as another example, uh, suppose um, I, I saw this uh, when I was um, at the World Bank, there was a survey in Indonesia. Um, all the surveys seem to be done on the main island of Java, and not some of the more outlying areas where poorer populations typically lived. Um, all is equal, and that's because, the, the, you know, it's more expensive to survey the farther out areas. Um, so again, there can be a trade off here um, in terms of your statistical power, which affects your internal validity and the external validity, um, because, you know, you do want to include more groups to be able to speak to have your policies, um, you know, um, be appropriate for those groups. Um, so again, there's some partial solutions here. You can try to incentivize replication work, which is typically, you know, low status or meta analysis. Um, you can also, and this is a little bit of a plea for me to you, to please collect comparable outcome variables because everybody seems to run away from each other in terms of the things that they study, uh, which makes it very hard to do any of this kind of meta research. Um, you know, I'm currently in a situation where I've got three uh, 
evaluations of guaranteed income programs in the US that I'm part of. And so that was really, uh, I was very excited about that, not just because they're cool programs, but also because, hey, now I can make sure that we're collecting the same outcome variables <laughs> um, and you know, tried to um, get some outcome variables from other studies and uh, share our outcomes with others out there as well. So you know, I think there could be a lot more of this kind of um, I don't want to call it discipline building, but project building approach in certain areas. Uh, potentially, this is something also that funders should look into, try to make sure that people have got comparable outcomes. Um, so there's some potential things here. Next stop on this whirlwind tour, um, actually how people interpret the evidence. So um, people can have behavioral biases. There's this whole field of behavioral economics. It wouldn't be surprising if policymakers also have behavioral biases. Um, and in fact, this is what I find in some work with Aidan Koval at the World Bank. Um, there's a number of biases you might think people have got, confirmation bias. Um, we are fo focusing on asymmetric optimism here, uh, which is, uh, think of it as a good news, bad news effect. So uh, you update more on positive news relative to your priors. Uh, so for example, you know, I ask you, what do you think the effect of a conditional cash transfer program is on enrollment rates? You say, you think it's going to increase enrollment rates by three percentage points. Now I either show you evidence that says it's five or it's one. If I show you evidence that says it's five, you're like, great, it's five, yeah. If I show you evidence that says it's one, you're like, oh, maybe it's two. Um, so you're updating more on the good news relative to your priors than the bad news. And this can have lasting effects. Um, also, we found that people didn't really know um, how to interpret um, variants. Um, and we did a follow-up where we had an incentive compatible willingness to pay game where we asked people to predict the effects of replications um, and they were uh, given some tokens that they could use to buy evidence <laughs> um, and we asked them well do you want uh, you know how much would you be willing to pay for this evidence that comes with 95 percent confidence intervals 99 percent confidence intervals um, or the equivalent sample size, given the, the other information in the question. Um, and people were treating, these were the equivalent um, amounts of precision here. So, you know, a certain 95% confidence interval has an equivalent 99% confidence interval that you could draw. We, we don't draw, but you could draw one. Um, and um, so people were willing to pay more for the results with these 99% confidence intervals than for the equivalent 95% confidence interval. And interestingly, uh, they seem to be paying more attention to the sample sizes uh, than any information on confidence intervals. Because if we, um, we, we elicited their priors before that, their, their full distribution of priors. And so we could say what a Bayesian would do, what a Bayesian uh, who is risk neutral would be willing to pay for, for this information. Um, and you can see the slope of evasion is much steeper there. They update more differently on results with wide or narrow confidence intervals. Um, and you get the closest to approximating that um, when you are asking people about sample sizes you're pre and presenting that information. Um, and you'd be surprised, but actually not all papers actually tell you for every regression at least what the sample size is a surprisingly large share don't so you know we could be rethinking a little bit some of the information we present and then finally um i do think that we need to think of some broader tools here i'll give you just one uh example of this i don't have any solutions here this is more of an open problem that hopefully people here can take on but um so um uh, Jack Clark and Jillian Hadfield. Jillian Hadfield is a law professor at my institution, um, and uh, uh, Jack Clark is uh, one of these uh, tech entrepreneur, not tech entrepreneur, um, AI folks um, who um, works in Silicon Valley, and they had written this paper on regulatory markets, essentially making two points. First, that developments in AI or tech more generally um, are really growing very fast and growing ever faster. Um, and yet regulation is slow moving. So that would seem to cause some kind of disconnect there. Um, and you know, we may see some examples of that, like people having to rush to regulate crypto and, and other things like that. Um, so as you know, the situation continues to change, we may need other ways of somehow catching up. Um, and these little changes around the edges um, may not be sufficient. So I don't have any solutions there, but I'll leave it there. Thanks.
was a nice segue to my topic, which will be the political economy of AI. But first, thanks everybody for the amazing conference and thanks for sticking around on a Friday night. A Friday evening, I guess. Um, right, this is on a different. All right. Um, okay, so I am going to make a case today that we should think about democratic control of the means of prediction. And so if you've, if you've read news in recent years, um, you've probably come around, uh, across headlines like these. Um, sorry, we're going back and forth here. Sorry, this is showing different slides. That's the thing. It's not the same slide deck on the... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, I sent one this morning. It's the one that had the news headlines. Yes, that's the right one. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, you'll, you you probably have come across headlines like these, um, talking about things like AI fairness and bias, about issues of data privacy, data property rights, um, differential privacy, maybe issues of so-called value alignment and uh, know, various ideas about the coming robot apocalypse, ideas about explainability of AI decisions, accountability of AI. And of course, all the issues surrounding the impact of AI on the labor market, on, on the future of work and labor market polarization. And so corresponding to, to these concerns about the impact of AI in various domains and the possible regulation, there's a lot of ongoing efforts right now to, to actually regulate AI in different ways. So the first headline here is about um, ongoing uh, efforts in the European Union about an artificial intelligence act. The second one is about the proposed AI Bill of Rights in the United States. And so there's, there's a lot of different debates that are happening here right now, right? So I, I already mentioned some of them. So there's the, the debates about fairness, discrimination, and inequality, the debates about um, how we should think about privacy and property rights over data, who controls data, should you have rights to withhold your data um, or to have your data deleted, for instance, um, sh uh, should we be worried about kind of a man versus machine value alignment issue? Um, think Space Odyssey or something like that. Um, how do we think about explaining AI decisions when more and more decisions are done in an automated way? How can we understand how these decisions came about and who is accountable for these decisions or responsible? Um, yeah, and how, how do we think about automation and, uh, and wage inequality? And so I guess what, uh, what I'm trying to do here and in this paper that, that, that I put at the bottom of the slide is trying to think about how we can think more systematically about these questions. So as it stands now, these, these are huge debates, right? If you go to conferences on these topics, they're literally like on the order of like 4,000, 5,000 paper submissions for any given conference on, on the impact of AI. It's largely dominated by computer scientists, uh, to some extent philosophers and law people. And I think eco economists actually have something to contribute here in terms of a systematic way of thinking about these issues. And in particular, here, here is um, how, how I would like to think about them in a, in a kind of more systematic way. First point to make is, I mean, AI and machine learning is a huge field, right? Again, like a huge amount of publications coming out every week. Um, but at the end of the day, 95% of AI boils down to automated ma maximization of some measurable objective. So there's some notion of an observable reward or an observable loss that gets maximized or minimized in an automated way. On the other, and that's kind of the, the, the framework for most of these debates, right? It's like we, we have some um, optimization of some objective and maybe something goes wrong in that optimization. How can we fix that? But then, of course, if uh, as economists, it doesn't come as a surprise that there's more than one person in a society. And so there's different people out there who have different objectives, who have different resources. And that implies that any type of automated decision will, will automatically generate winners and losers in general. And so 
um, if we take all these different objectives or different notions of, of welfare of, of different people and we try to aggregate them into society level assessments that means we have to somehow trade off individuals gains and losses right so it's not just there's one objective and we have achieved it or not we have to think about how do we deal with the fact that there's all these different people who have different objectives that have to be satisfied in some way and uh, so we when we then want to think about how to make ai good in some sense we have to think about how to bring together the objectives uh, that the ai systems are maximizing and whatever our notion of social welfare is and my argument would be that we need uh, various forms of democratic control over both the objective functions but also the, the resources that go into maximizing them such as algorithms data and computational infrastructure to kind of close the gap between the objectives maximized by ai as it stands now and what we might consider social welfare and so let me elaborate on each of these points so again ai is basically optimization right so um, what goes on under the hood is very often very complicated there is like millions of different algorithms out there the math is complicated the computer science is complicated at the end of the day is there's some measurable objective and we're maximizing it and so to illustrate that here's a quote from from one of the leading textbooks on ai which actually sounds very very similar to how an economics textbook might define a rational agent so what this textbook says is that um, the, the goal of AI is basically to construct such ra rational agents, which take uh, basically essentially take data and map them into decisions in order to maximize some, some measurable objective. And that's true for all these different subfields of machine learning. So I gave you some examples here. Supervised learning, maybe the most well-known, right, which is just about prediction. And then the objective is some notion of an out-of-sample prediction error. Um, in targeted treatment assignment, Think about decide who to hire or not who to admit to a school or not who to give a medical treatment or not you want to maximize some notion of like an average merit of of the treated in multi-armed bandits and all their the variations the goal is to maximize a sum of an or a sum or an average of outcomes over time and similarly in reinforcement learning goal is again to maximize some kind of discounted stream of a measurable outcome where in this case, actions kind of often have indirect effects through, through changing the state of a system to then allow us in the future to, to maximize these outcomes. But bottom line, there is some well-defined measurable outcome and all the algorithm is doing is try to, to maximize, uh, maximize that outcome. On the other hand, a common presumption in many theories of justice, and that's true for the type of frameworks we are used to thinking about in welfare economics, like public finance, for instance, but it's also true for many, many other frameworks that philosophers might have discussed in political philosophy is that it's, at the end of the day, you can base normative assessments about society um, based on assessments about um, the well-being of individuals. And so the, to formalize that, you can think about a set of individuals. Um, I, each individual has some notion of welfare, VI, and then we have to aggregate that in some way to a society level assessment of social welfare. And one can debate at length about each of these items, who should be the individuals who are included, who matters, um, how do we think about the welfare, is it utility, is it something else, and how do we trade off the welfare of different people. But, but that kind of um, situation is kind of almost unavoidable, I would argue, um, when we think about the impact of something on, on society or in society. And so that, of course, then raises the question, if we think that, that the decisions that AI systems make matter, um, they are consequential and arguably they are in many contexts, then we have to ask ourselves, how, how do we bring together the objectives maximized by AI with what we care about as a society? And to ask that question differently, we can ask which agents have the interests, the values and the capacity to bring together um technology and and what we consider desirable and so arguably like 90 percent of the debates about the impact of ai are all about voluntary ethical behavior right so it's it's kind of you you persuade corporate managers or engineers to be a little bit better to be a little less biased to correct some mistakes in their system and then um everything will be well in some sense not necessarily how we might think about this as economists, arguably corporations are profit maximizing entities by and large, maybe with, with some deviations from that, but if something go, uh, consistently goes against profits, uh, uh, private corporations probably not going to pursue it. And so there are many circumstances um, where profit maximization might not be aligned with social welfare maximization for all, all kinds of reasons. For one, Externalities are almost the point of any form of machine learning, right? Like 
it's almost never about the individual the decision individual data collection it's all about like the pattern and um, what happens across individuals across instances um, it's kind of baked into the structure of these problems on the other hand inequality and um, who matters uh, might be very different between the people who control um, who control the means of prediction what we care about and so in some, we need some forms of democratic control to bring together um, what AI is maximizing and what we care about as a society. And so I guess in the interest of time, I have to cut it a bit short, but um, I think this is a very useful framework, right? I'm just put it here very abstractly, but I think it's a very useful framework to restructure a lot of these debates that are ongoing. And I just give you a, a quick list here. So in, in the literature on fairness and discrimination in AI, Ultimately, they have kind of copied from economists, and I think for the worse here, in terms of defining um, discrimination just as a deviation from profit maximization. Right? So it's essentially variations of this notion of taste-based discrimination. And so if the algorithm actually maximizes what you care about, if it maximizes profits in particular, then um, all this fairness literature would say um, there, there is no bias, there's no discrimination going on, no matter how unequal the outcomes are. And we can contrast that with just a consequentialist account of how, how do AI decisions impact social welfare and more specifically, how do they impact inequality across people. Relatedly, in all the discussions about privacy and data property rights, so you have like the discussions on the, on the legal side about what privacy means, you have the discussions on the computer science side, in particular in the field of uh, concern with so-called differential privacy. Um, it all boils, boils down to individual property rights and thinking about does an individual have incentives to withhold their data, right? So does it make a difference whether your data are in the data set or not? Um, and if it doesn't, then privacy is preserved according to these definitions. But it completely misses the point in some sense because you can perfectly preserve privacy in, in, in terms of these definitions without affecting um, learning in any way. So there's a lot of math results that, that prove that. And putting it in econlingo, the data externalities are the point, right? Or if you regress y on the x, the, the point of collecting an individual instance of y and the x is not that instance, it's about learning the coefficient of regressing y on the x. And it's kind of the same thing in, in all kinds of more complicated settings. And so to the extent that data externalities are the point and, and kind of the key ingredient for all downstream consequences, whether positive or negative, then we have to think about collective governance and private uh, individual property rights are not going to get us there. The discussions about value alignment, very dominant among Silicon Valley types and um, kind of very much informed by, by Hollywood sci-fi movies. Um, it's all about man versus machine, right? There's always like one, one heroic human and then an AI that goes haywire and um, somehow wants to eliminate humans or something like that. Um, and it's often framed in terms of like a long-term, far in the future type of concern, maybe after we have superhuman AI. I would argue more often than not, the issue is that it's, there's a conflict between corporate and social interests. Right? So the fact that Facebook is maximizing ad clicks is not a bug, it's a feature of what they're doing, um, whether or not it, that's good for the rest of society. And so we have to think about how to bring those two together. It's not that they are doing something, that there's some technical error in, in maximizing ad clicks that's going on. Uh, the discussions about explainability and accountability um, typically focused on individual level recourse, right? So it's some, there's some automated decision making system, and then you have uh, you're supposed to have a right to to understand why was the decision made that affected you, and is somebody accountable? Can you maybe appeal the decision? Um, another way of thinking about explainability, though, would be thinking about not necessarily explaining that all the technical details of how the decision came about or thinking about what makes a simple decision making system and instead having a public debate about what the objectives are that we want to maximize. And that's in a way, I think also something where, where I guess academics and others can act as intermediaries for the public debate or contribute to, to democratic discourse by saying, explaining these things are just maximizing some measurable objectives. We have to discuss what are the objectives we want to maximize. Is it ad clicks? Is it monopoly pricing for Amazon? Is it something else? Um, and that, that is accessible, I would argue, to wide debate, even if like all the intricate details of the newest large language model um, are not. Um, and all right, I guess I'll, I'll stop here and hand it over to Erin. Thanks. Should I do anything? <laughs> <laughs>
or will it automatically? Great. I, it's best when I don't have to do anything. Okay, so um, you know what? I'm going to take one of these so I can walk around. Maybe. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, Thanks for sticking around. It's, uh, it's the last session. I'm the last person speaking. Uh, I'm going to keep this very exciting. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the role of evidence, policies, and politics. Here's, here's the punchline. I think evidence is important. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also think that the evidence generating process is nuanced. It's more nuanced than we as economists and technocrats would like to sometimes say. And in fact, that politics plays an essential role in that and that that's okay. And I'm gonna use uh, a topic that I know something about. I've done research for the last 15, 20 years, uh, minimum wages. And uh, I'll talk about the interplay between evidence politics and policy making and, and see if we can learn something from that, uh, you can decide. So, um, you know, we, we obviously are familiar with the idea of evidence-based policies, but of course, in, we generally, we think that that's a good thing, but where do evidence come from? Uh, sort of the ideal world, and I'm a labor economist, so it's like, okay, we wanna know how does uh, earning subsidy affect labor supply uh, or giving a guaranteed income affect labor supply? We'll do a randomized control trial and find estimate the elasticity. And based on that and maybe some theory, we will come up with an optimal policy. So that's sort of like the archetype, right? It's the gold standard we would sort of like to think. But, but you know, a lot of times we're interested in big policy changes and by big, I don't just mean the size of the policy changes, may be more complicated and not necessarily amenable to uh, RCT or anything analogous uh, for, for that matter. Lots of examples have been talked about industrial policies with backwards and forward linkages in the development process may be complicated with big general equilibrium effects. Macro policies, what do tight labor markets do? Actually, some work that I have done recently with David Otter and Anne McGrew found that surprisingly large increase in labor market competition in the current tight labor market, leading to a surprising compression in wage inequality, raising about a quarter of uh, 90-10 wage differential in three years. I don't think I would have known that if, if it weren't for the fact that policies were pursued that or stuff happened that led to a particularly tight labor market. So some of these bigger changes are just really qualitatively different. You could have nonlinear wage Phillips curves, price Phillips curves that you just didn't know anything about. You're, you could have a model that you could calibrate and uh, you know extrapolate. Uh, you could be happy with that, but do you really believe it? I don't know, I, I'm not sure. Same thing arises even something more, something less complicated like minimum wage policies. What 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 is it actually what what is the impact when you start experimenting with something really different and should you experiment with something really different so here i you know it's an interesting way to think about what this is uh, this is actually something that richard freeman my my advisor actually back in the day actually called natural experiments it's a little different as this uh, this this is a great interview from alan the late alan kruger talking about sort of how Richard's notion of natural experiment was really sort of focused on this notion of a big policy change, which is different from what how we usually use it these days, which is just about giving us some kind of an exogenous policy variation, not about the size of it. But the examples, for example, tight labor market in the 1960s or the Civil Rights Act. So these are sort of big changes that pretend that help us sort of learn something, right? So this is a different, different um, uh, this, this is uh, these are big changes and these big changes I would submit to you are almost always they almost always require political considerations they don't just happen purely from a technocratic source and I think that's just the nature of how policies are made and and, and potentially should be made 
So let me show this, I'll discuss this point using the sort of example, a case study of minimum wages. So I'm going to sort of go through a bunch of stuff, but here, here's, the, here's the key point I want to take away. A lot of what we know about minimum wage effects began in the early 90s in the United States studying the so-called new minimum wage literature. Why did it start here and then? It actually was because we went through all, almost a decade in the 80s without raising the federal minimum wage. That led to a bunch of states starting to raise minimum wages, leading to the kind of variation that led to papers like the ones listed here, case study of 1988, California minimum wage, or the New Jersey minimum wage increase in the early 90s compared to Pennsylvania, the famous case study of Cardin Kruger, and then combining a bunch of those right, running panel regressions, this is the kind of stuff that started happening in the 1990s and led to various different types of estimates, etc. I actually partly contributed to this literature later. This is work in uh, with uh, Michael Reich and Bill Lester. We sort of tried to put together some of this and in, uh, in our paper in 2010 using these neighboring counties comparison, uh, looking at a low wage sectors, we basically found that there was this increase in earnings and wages as expected and relatively muted impact on employment. So this was what we found. This We tried to also reconcile some of the differences in the literature. And I think around then, if you ask me what I thought was sort of the, was seen as kind of the, you know, around the research frontier, this would be one of, certainly one of them. And based on this evidence and other evidence, you know, uh, I, I, I would sort of conclude around that time that the minimum wage impact was likely fairly modest on employment. That's good. That allows us to sort of potentially increase the minimum wage. But here's the interesting thing. What was the context of that finding? That context is sort of uh, usefully understood by this picture. So what is this plotting? This is plotting one a commonly used measure of the bite or the strength of the minimum wage, which is simply the ratio of the minimum wage to the median wage, sometimes called the Cates index. So here in green is the U US federal minimum wage. You'll see that basically it, in the 1990 to 2010 period, you know, the US federal minimum wage was one of the, was the lowest of most of those times, and in, in, in certainly in amongst other rich countries, uh, reaching as low as something like 30% of the median wage, which is really low. So it was a particularly low minimum wage period, both by historic and comparative comparative context. So if you ask me, okay, this great variation comparing all these states because we do such a crappy job designing minimum wage policy. So we go for 10 years without raising the nominal minimum wage, leading states to change it here and there. All these natural experiments are created. So we have this great variation around a really low threshold. So that's the context. And so, okay, now based on that, tell me what's, what's the right evidence-based policy? What do you say? Well, I mean, I was sort of asked to do that. So I wrote this thing in 2014 for the Hamilton Project. What is an evidence-based minimum wage policy? So I really thought about this. I'm like, well, I, like, I want to look at the evidence, at least my reading of it. You know, people, there's disagreements. But nonetheless, I think there was sort of an emerging consensus that most likely the employment losses are probably not very large in this range. But this range is a, happens to be, well, we have this best evidence from America uh, from uh, one of the lowest minimum wage contexts. Uh, and, and, and but that's what we're going to draw the evidence from. Well, my evidence based policy was to say, well, we'll go as far as I can go uh, based on this evidence range. And I'll just stop so around there. I think the upper part of the range is OK. That's about half the median wage. And that's that was my recommendation. It's a fairly small c conservative recommendation of based on what we see. Now, that was, you know, it, as it happens to be the case around then, there was also substantial political movement to raise the minimum wage. 
something called fight for evidence-based policy. No, it's called fight for 15. And that actually was not trying to find what the evidence base was and sort of go to the top of it based on you know the likely marginal treatment effect. It was saying, okay, actually we want something much higher. And that led to 40 plus cities establishing minimum wages for the first time in America. Uh, eight states today have a path to $15 or more. And uh, you know, evidence has been filling in for much higher range than would have been possible if the uh, folks pursued my, took up my suggestion back in 2014. So my suggestion would not have allowed me to do the further work than to try to tease out what that additional evidence suggested, including in, I'm just going to skip forward, in work in 2019, uh, where we actually tried to quantify the overall effect. It's almost five o'clock, so it's time to explain the bunching estimator. No, it's actually really simple. The idea is just compare, count the number of jobs paying below the, the new minimum wage, compare that to, so those are gone because they're either getting a raise or they're destroyed compared to the number of jobs being just at or right above and add them up. So what we found again was overall the impact in the last, you know, 30, 40 years was relatively muted. But here's the interesting thing. We actually started to look to see what happens when, you know, do we actually see some kind of a turning point? Now here's the interesting thing. This has actually become a lot more common to do because the push for much larger minimum wages has really changed the conversation, including in this literature from what is the impact of minimum wage in this very relatively low area, but rather where does it turn, under what circumstances does it turn, what's the heterogeneity in the effects? These are harder questions, mind you, but more. But that is actually much more representative of the type of work that's being done. But that would really probably would not have been done as much if we were mostly in the kind of evidence range that it used to be, or even if uh, American policymakers had taken up my 2014 suggestion. So that's that i'm just gonna move on that was in us we can now go across the pond to the uk the uk actually is a particularly interesting case study for understanding the policy making process of minimum wages the uk didn't really have a national minimum wage until the late 90s when it was established it was controversial like it is uh, in the us the the conservative party were were relatively opposed to it however they also established this sort of tripartite style low pay commission which involved labor business but also technocrats and uh and 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 over the years the both the combination of research as well as perhaps the style of bringing in stakeholders led to a this policy of gaining a lot of support and traction uh, to the point where in 2015, the Conservative Party made a very surprise announcement of establishing a new, much higher national living wage policy. Here's, here's a picture. This is, if you could read the bottom, and this is from the BBC saying, the announcement of a nine pound per hour living wage came as somewhat of a surprise, as typical sort of British understatement was not somewhat of a surprise. It was a very much of a surprise. And this, however, led to a very different, very different uh, level of increase of the, of the minimum wage in that country. Here I'm, again, showing the increase as a percentage of the, uh, the minimum as a percent of the median hourly pay rate. You can see it was sort of hovering around 50, 55. And then 2015 started substantial increase uh, of, of that policy of the minimum wage bite going all the way as planned to about two thirds of the median wage. Now, again, that change, and this was interesting because in 2019, I was asked by the by the then uh, the, the the government uh, the uh, to the UK um, treasure uh, chancellor to conduct a review, and that was in the sort of the decision making process. So I looked back and what what the evidence, but I also spoke with a lot of folks, including at LPC. And here's the thing. The LPC was seen as a very credible body 
And at the same time, what was clear is that even though they had strong evidence on the policy thus far, which was generally seen in UK as fairly uncontroversial, uh, the evidence suggesting that the employment losses in, as were rather very muted and it was a successful policy. However, this technocratic body or you know, the LPC could would not actually be able to just unilaterally propose a major experimental increase of this magnitude. So it was seen as something like this, this kind of a bigger change necessarily had to come in some sense from the polity. It was not just a technocratic decision. It was, that was a, the technocratic part was an important aspect. The evidence was important, but it would, couldn't by itself be the basis for that decision. That decision was a political decision. It was also a popular one. You know, hopefully when we experiment with policies that are big, they're not terribly unpopular, uh, could happen. But that's, but, but even if it's popular, it doesn't mean it's a good policy, but there's only really sometimes one way to find out. And as it turns out, that policy through 20, 2019 turned out to actually be quite quite effective here the, the best work on this and again there's a number of papers but this is this is the best work again expanding using the same type of analysis i showed you for the us this is paper by japoni et al finding that it led to substantial earnings increases uh for for low-wage workers in in uk without really any evidence of 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 uh, anything uh any substantial employment effects so that this is a very useful example because we don't have something like the low pay commission in the U US, right? Instead, we have half the country has no effective minimum wage. 725 is not binding anywhere today, just about. Instead, we have half the country with state minimum wages that sometimes exceed you know, substantially even more than UK amounts and other times uh, there's nothing. Uh, but even in a country where I think I see it as a, the, the minimum wage making process in the UK being quite successful, the question of how you use evidence to make changes is not something that is simply a technocratic one. And we have seen, by the way, this type of process occurring elsewhere too, including Germany, where which also established for the first time a national minimum wage policy in in the teens. Uh, it was controversial at the time, a lot of fear about it possibly causing a harm. But then again, the evidence has broadly been supportive of overall it, it in net being a good thing. And now there's considerations of, and in fact, the the, the social democrats have have proposed and are implementing a substantial increase. So this type of process where is one where you can see evidence playing a role but evidence is not the that's not the only thing that uh, that's not the only thing that actually is guiding it so i think that this sort of brings up you know this is the last thing i'll say that, so what is the role of economists and you know as, and researchers generally um you know i think obviously we want to study and understand what the impact of policies are but we also do need to have some degree of humility we have to understand that that input is just going to be one part of it, right? There's this, so to use the multi-arm bandit example that Max laid out, there's this exploration, exploitation trade-off. But that trade-off is necessarily going to include normative judgments, and that is going to be beyond technocratic ones only. And I think even in something as simple as deciding exactly where to set the minimum wage, you see this playing out it's obviously even more so in more complicated type of policy. So I'll stop here and uh, take, you know, we can turn over to a discussion. just wanted to follow up on this fascinating discussion about the minimum wage. Uh, how, if you would design a system here from scratch in the US, how would you think about it? I guess I would think you would want different minimum wages in different places, uh, different in New York than rural Missouri or whatever. But uh, so yeah, I guess that's my question to you. How, uh, because it's, it seems a little surprising, for example, UK, that it is uh, the same across the board. 
That's that's great. Um, are we taking uh, single questions or take a bunch or? Uh, let me just. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, great question. I think so. When in 2019, when I was in UK, one of the things I was looking into uh, was the idea of a London top up, because after all, cost of living is higher there. And this, by the way, comes up in the US context all the time as well. One of the most interesting thing is there was uniform opposition to a London top up. And, uh, and, 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 and the, the most, there are a lot of things I heard, but the most memorable thing was like the people in London, all, they already have the good stuff. They already have the best, you know, the best restaurants, the best this, best that. Now, why do they also have to have the higher wage? It's obviously from, you know, like, well, well, the cost of living's higher, like, but so how do you trade off that against amenities? I, I don't know what, whatever it is, the idea of that differential was not something that was appealing. Even though the idea that cost of living is substantially higher and is, is not, was not something that people didn't understand. Exactly. So, so, you know, then it becomes a question, okay, we can, we as researchers certainly should provide these arguments and put, put, put forth, but at a certain level, then there's a certain decisions that based are based on, you know, maybe different welfare calculations, maybe they base their different types of fairness considerations that are not easily addressed or understood within our welfare welfareist calculations or any other even broader perspectives we may have but uh that is you know that that's i think at a certain level a, you know one a, a decision that the public at large hopefully can make yeah sort of following on i think uh, i think Erin, you've, you've drawn attention to a very important point about how, how do you do evidence. I mean, we glorify evidence-based policy, but especially in moments of transition, we're interested in policies or institutional arrangements that lie outside the range of our experience um, that would have allowed us to provide the type of evidence that would satisfy the high and demanding standards of causal inference um, in contemporary economics. And then what does that, does that give economics, contemporary economics, therefore, in, you know, inherently conservative bias because we're stuck and the only thing that we can consider are things that are incremental. In some fields, I would say we're luckier. I think, you, you know, your field of labor economics is one where there's significant amount of variation across the world. Uh, in labor market institutions. You work, for example, on sectoral wage bargaining. That's a kind of a radical idea for the United States. But of course, many other countries have sectoral wage bargaining. There is problems of external validity and how do you extrapolate, but we can still draw on evidence from that. Um, there are many other fields where, you know, policies and institutions have converged to such an extent that you don't have that kind of variation at all. I would say macro is probably one mm -hmm. of the worst. Thankfully, we have occasionally okay. country like like Mexico, uh, like Argentina or Turkey that engages in some you know macro policy <laughs> experiments, and then we can say you know extreme you know some of the extreme policies are bad, but other other areas. So the question is, if I heard you correctly, I mean I, I heard you as saying that look, when we don't have the relevant evidence, then politics become you know it's just politics. Let politics determine or. But I want to clarify that. I mean, I'm worried that that you know the, the muscles that we don't use in economics are atrophy. That is, that the kind of thinking on the basis of circumspect evidence or or conceptual theorizing um, that is important part of the conceptual toolbox of uh, economists is something that we don't necessarily use anymore or teach our students. Uh, because ultimately that's not the kind of stand stuff that uh, passes the test, the, you know, the, the requirement of you know, causal inference. And that, you know, when we are, you know, so I, I don't know what your, what your second paragraph after your conclusion that we don't have the kind of evidence to be certain what the effect of doubling the minimum wage would be, whether you sort of said, but let me sort of, you know, try to summarize what, you know, 
economic thinking, economic style thinking would say about that? Or you simply said, you know, we just don't know. So I hope that the answer is the first, and I'm also interested in how sort of economics more broadly can be useful in those kinds of settings uh, where we're not able to pin the causal inference. Um, and, and it's not only that, you know, that, that, um, that, that we're not overly detracting economics research into areas where we find small results because we can actually do experiments, but also that we're able to talk meaningfully about areas where larger scale institutional changes um, are, are, are required. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, do you want to yeah, answer? No, no, no. I'm, oh. Can I actually briefly jump in on that? Because um, there is actually one of the things that I'm excited about with respect to forecasting is precisely that it can help you practice um, trying to come to grips with how much you don't know and making your best guess and seeing how wrong you are and trying to calibrate over time from that. So, you know, the platform is geared towards researchers, but we've certainly been trying to do experiments with policymakers as well. Um, and a part of the excitement there is that if we have some RCT results that uh, these forecasts are connected to, and so you get some kind of ground truth that you can compare against, uh, I mean, most of the time you're not going to have those RCT results. Most of the time you're going to have to make forecasts more, you know, and make policies based on your own intuition. So you can try to, you know, um, get a better sense of and calibrate yourself better to avoid overconfidence um you know by sort of practicing <laughs> forecasting and getting some feedback on it uh for those cases where we do have results so a partial solution not a complete one yeah i'm oh, sorry go ahead no sorry let me just say yeah I, mean, I think just in terms of danny's question i think fundamentally we're going to have to navigate that exploration exploitation trade-off right so the question is how do we do that and i think part of what i'm who i'm speaking to here is to my fellow economists including you know micro uh applied micro types where we spend a lot of time worrying about exactly sort of causal inference uh but at a certain level we're going to have to have a certain degree of humility i think and that includes that humility i would say includes Admitting, admitting a broader type of evidence when, for example, certain types of evidence we're most comfortable with is not available, but also understand that there is a certain normative criteria in that in that trade off. And that is not simply my own preferences over exactly how much I should vary between the exploration and exploitation. It, it may differ right from the public at large i think we should do a really good job explaining what the evidence is and what the limitations are but then understand that that sort of dis the final decision sometimes is going to involve things outside our expertise and and i think that it, it, it in a certain level it's okay that it does is what i'm saying I'm going to jump in now. <laughs> uh, perhaps maybe why I was so eager is because I wanted to ask a version of Danny's question, which is, um, how do you think about, uh, you know, we, we've kind of limited, I mean, maybe it's my own implicit limitation, but the discussion to evidence within economics, how do you think about evidence outside of economics that is maybe quantitative in political science or sociology, and even non-quantitative evidence maybe in history or philosophy, and how does that enter into sort of how the three of you on the panel sort of think about, uh, you know, informing policy or how, what, do economists have a role in aggregating that information? Can we say something about that? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, maybe yeah. quickly jumping in on that. I mean, I think there's all this evidence from other fields, right? And of course, there's many ways of learning about the world that are not just about running RCTs or finding natural experiments. But on top of that, I would also add that there's just a huge component of, of policymaking is normative judgments and even conceptually framing what you're thinking about and framing what, what the space of conceivable policies is. Right? And so in a way, there's a lot of thinking of all kinds and uh, discussing of all kinds of ways to be done. 
that's outside the remit of causal inference and which other academic fields, among others, can contribute. Okay, um, I'll ask a sort of questions mostly for Eva, I guess. It's a, it seems like a lot of the infrastructure you're building up around RCTs kind of presumes a world in which there are these like fairly stable effects of RCTs. And so that we're, we, it's so important to have transparency and reproducibility because we have this technology that if we deploy it this way, will give us kind of a, a you know, we'll get like the, conductivity of tungsten graph over time where it's like we will get the 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 you know we'll converge on the right point estimate and i'm just sort of curious is, is that wrong or is that uh, like am i is that a caricature or is that in fact like kind of like nope yes there is a right answer and we're going to find it by kind of successively running sort of the at least experiments of the same kind in a variety of different contexts and yeah just sort of sort of curious about how the the experiment sort of epistemological infrastructure depend is sort of related to like the worldview of like how are we trying to you know what is the structure of the world that we're trying to trying to learn about yeah i mean so i wish i could say that i did think that we were going to converge to something that would be reassuring in a way that would be in some sense an easy solution i'm not sure that there would be because if you think that results vary so substantially across different contexts and that, by the way, when I did find that with the GIA paper with it, that I was showing that graph uh, from, um, the figure from, you know, I wasn't expecting to find that actually. I was very disappointed. It was kind of heartbreaking. Um, there was so much more variation across contexts than I anticipated. And if I think about it, over time is just another kind of context, really, right? I mean, things change over time. If nothing else, you've done this experiment before so hopefully it had an effect <laughs> you know hopefully things have changed um and there's also some stuff um you know you, you can look at the bold at all paper um where uh, political economy issues come into play with specifically when um you, you have done it before you're, you've tried to now you know scale it up and whatnot um things can be very different so yeah i wish things were stable like that over time but sadly i don't think we're there Well, I think it's still worth trying to, I mean, it's still worth trying to get evidence, even if it's going to be, you know, limited in how informative it's going to be. Um, and actually, you know, I was referring earlier to forecasting. Well, one of the things um, that Stefano and Devin have done that's very neat is they had one experiment where they asked people to forecast um, effects for different kinds of groups. Um, and um the forecasts you know they they weren't completely correct and there's certainly a danger of going down that route and i wouldn't want to overemphasize forecasts by any means um but there did seem to be some promise in potentially using them in connection with rct results to then say okay well can we expand at least a little bit the you know especially if we're basically the way i sort of see the world I think a lot of people are de facto Bayesians even if they won't admit it <laughs> okay so like if I were coming to you with some study on something you really think thought was implausible like extrasensory perception you would really want to see strong compelling <laughs> evidence of that before you're going to shift your priors um so that kind of you know starts to say well look your priors are actually a big part of how you're interpreting evidence let's try to make sure that we actually gather them because otherwise you know you're never going to be very clear about how you're interpreting that evidence and it won't be obvious how that sort of interpretation is happening so um yeah i'm not sure that completely gets at your question but Very quickly, so I, I thought it was interesting the minimum wage uh, evidence and how to communicate it and how policymakers discuss about it. It's kind of packed to the median wage and it makes this statistic that's kind of easy to present. And I guess I was wondering in the presence of growing inequalities, how that statistic is basically changing over time, admitting that it's the easier way to convey it and probably the most effective way to get a number in their heads, so. Yeah, so uh, 
That's yeah, that's a great question. What happens if the distribution of wages is changing so much that the bite is is is, is uh, changing for that reason? Um, in general, we want some easy way of expressing or conveying uh, conveying something as simple as just the bite of this policy. Is this really mattering? It turns out that that ratio actually is quite useful, but you can you can use other measures like oh how what share of workers are directly affected by the policy, etc. But but in general, what a really interesting question is if you're looking for a turning point, like oh when the policy when when the minimum wage is really too high, where should we expect that turning point to be? Along what measure? Is it really the minimum to median wage? But what happens if median wages are really low in rural areas and rural areas, there aren't that many employers and employers have more power. And so actually it could be really different. And so that's actually one of the challenges when you actually start going beyond just what the average effect is in your full evidence base to really try to decipher that heterogeneity or nonlinearity, even understanding what should it, what is it nonlinear by? turns out to be a non-trivial question and actually, but it is the one that people are actually engaging with more, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's. I guess it'll be the last question. Oh, sure. Oh, that's a lot of pressure, but that's okay. Um, so I was wondering um, if you had reactions about if this type of conversation about how to connect evidence to policy should be more of a part of training of economists, either at the PhD level or uh, somewhat younger level, and ideas for, um, and if so, ideas about ways to make these types of connections more prominent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think, uh, I think there's many levels to you know of, of answers to that question. I mean, at, at a basic level, I think it starts with, to me, it starts with understanding what are we asking, what are we sort of teaching people to do, what what is what do we see as our role, right? And that that's a broader question. What's our role? Communicating our findings to the polity. To, uh, to technocrats and the government, you know, so in the policy world, I think in general, I think it's really critical for us as economists to be able to communicate to a broader group of people. And I, and I really mean broader, more, more broad than people who are in power in the policy world, but really to the public at large. And I think that is, that's actually a democratizing mission. And I think that's a mission that I think is quite important because when we actually speak to a broader group, that is critical in making an informed decision. When we say, oh, when I claim that evidence, when you know there's some trade-off to be done when you're ma making decisions about bigger changes, well, who are we informing? Is it just folks in the White House? I would hope not. I hope it's much broader than that. And so being able to speak to that broader world is I think a key part of, as I see, you know, our role as economists. Here, here. <laughs> okay. That's it. <laughs>